down Highway 61, through Tunica, and into Clarksdale, Mississippi. This is where the music was born and bred, in miles and miles of cotton fields, one-room shacks, dirt roads stretching across the countryside. Standing at the crossroads where 49 meets 61, or waiting in the dark for the train to make it down the track and jump on board because anywhere else is better than this place. This is where the music came to be. Boogie Lightning against the sky. Tommy Johnson and Charlie Patton making their packs with the devil at the stroke of midnight. <coughs> Leg bar at the crossroads of Africa and America. Black men and women dragged in chains and shipped in chains and whipped into Mississippi, where the music came to life under the whip and the gun, and hours of relentless sun beating down every day on the slave peoples. Cutting trees, Pulling stumps like mules, plowing the cleared land, planting, picking cotton, dawn to dark. The music deep inside them, coming out in grunts and groans, and the moans of the spirits of the ancestors in the train whistles. In the air, everywhere, the land soaked with their blood, the night alive with the spirit voices wailing over their crops, the fruits of their labors, the richness of the land, a constant mockery. Everything they made was taken away. Everything was stolen from them. But the music made life go on and moved people to stay alive and led them out of the Delta to Chicago or Detroit, but some big city, some other place where no cotton grows and the crackers wear suits or carry lunch pails, and the plants pay that good money, and the music gets harder and louder, lightning, electricity, leaping from the walls. The Delta sound brought to bear on the city deeper than deep from where all feeling rises. The Delta sound. There ain't too many left. There ain't too many more left. There ain't too many left at all.
have to say at this juncture, I think we're sounding pretty good for never doing this before. <laughs> we just met today. <laughs> Tommy Johnson, born in Crystal Springs, Mississippi, in 1896, left home around 1912 with an older woman and traveled north to Rolling Fork, then settled farther north by Boyle near the Dockery Farm in 1913 right on the line of the Peavine Special, where he spent a year or two studying with Charlie Patton, Willie Brown, Dick Bankston, Ben Marie and them at Dockery's, and then returned south to Crystal Springs and his family and the peoples who used to know him. By this time, Tommy Johnson had developed a style of his own, not just in his music, but as a compulsive womanizer, an acute alcoholic who would drink almost anything, sterno, shoe polish, <laughs> His brother Waddell asked him how he had learned to play so well in such a short time. He said the reason he knowed so much said he sold himself to the devil. I asked him how. <laughs> And Tommy Johnson said, if you want to learn how to play anything you want to play and learn how to make songs yourself, you take your guitar and you go to where a road crosses that way, where a crossroads is. Get there. Be sure to get there. Just a little before 12 o'clock that night, so you know you'll be there. You have your guitar and be playing a piece, sitting there by yourself. You have to go by yourself and be sitting there playing a piece. Hmm. A big black man will walk up there and take your guitar and he'll tune it. <laughs> Then he'll play a piece and hand it back to you. Huh. That's the way I learned how to play anything I want. And Bob Palmer adds. The black man referred to is recognizable as Legba, a Yoruba trickster god who opens the path for other supernatural powers and is traditionally associated with crossroads. As the only wholly unpredictable deity in the Yoruba pantheon, the rituals that are virtually guaranteed to bring the desired result from all others do not always work in his case. Legba became identified with the devil of Christianity.
When the train runs through your backyard, you know it's hard to stay in any one place too long. Take the Peavine Special, hooked up to the Dockery Farm, where the Delta Blues came to flower just before the First World War. Peavine starts out from Cleveland, Mississippi, at 4 a.m., runs two miles south to Boyle by Tommy Johnson's place in 1913, then over to the private depot at Will Dockery's plantation, west over to Rosedale, and back to Cleveland before nightfall. And when it's darkness on the Delta, you can hear that train coming from a long way off. And it's so easy to ride. Take the Illinois Central from New Orleans straight through to Chicago in 24 hours. One-way fare in 1940 is still just $16.95. Or if you catch it in Memphis, at the top of the Delta, one way to Chicago for $11.10. <laughs> or say you don't want to go that far. Hmm. Catch the Yazoo and Mississippi Valley Railroad and ride the Yellow Dog up from Moorhead, where the Southern Cross the Dog, all the way to Tuckwild where Highway 61, I'm sorry, where Highway 49 goes east and west. And where? One night in 1903, sitting in the station, waiting for a train that was already nine hours behind time, trying to get to a gig, the great W.C. Handy, father of the blues, first heard a Delta man worry his guitar strings and sing his little railroad song. Down by the station, catch that train and ride. Why stay in this godforsaken place when it's so easy to slide? Sonny Boy and uh, his guitar player named Robert Lockwood Jr. And uh, the title of the piece is taken from 
Magic Sam for 21 days in jail. Robert Lockwood Jr. was born on a farm between Aubrey and Marvell, Arkansas, around 25 miles north and west of Helena. On March 27, 1915, as a young boy growing up in Helena with his mother, around 1928 or 29, Robert Lockwood had the good fortune to meet his mentor, Robert Johnson, who had big eyes for young Robert's mama and hung around the house there long enough for Robert Jr. to pick up on his music. Robert says, at the time, my ambition was to play a piano or an organ. I had heard a lot of guitar players, but I wasn't interested in them. But then Robert come along, and he was backing himself up without anybody helping him, and sounded good. He would go somewhere to play for people and tear up the house. So I got right on top of that. By him having a crush on my mother, I got a chance to be around him a little bit. I think I'm about the only one he ever taught. Around 1934-35, Rice Miller began to appear at Robert Lockwood's door, seeking his mother's permission. Could Robert Jr. accompany him? Rice Miller, later known as Sonny Boy Williamson, secret hero of these poems the greatest harmonica player of all time. <laughs> so Robert says, I started going to places in Arkansas with him, but he worried my mother for about two years before she let me go to Mississippi with him. And sure enough, we had some pretty strange experiences there. One time, we left the Delta I went up in the hill country, and in Sardis, they put us in jail for vagrancy for 21 days. That was on a Friday. On Saturday, we went up to the second floor and raised the jailhouse windows and started playing. In a matter of minutes, the jailhouse was surrounded with people. There was a little fence down there, about as big as the one by the side of my yard, and the people started throwing nickels and dimes and quarters and dollars over that fence. The trustee went out and picked up the money for us, and we knew he didn't bring it all to us. We knew he got fat, but when he turned it into us, we had made four hundred dollars that day. Four hundred dollars. What was that? Four hundred dollars. Four hundred dollars. I know we don't know what that means. <laughs> 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 
That was $19.35 too. That's about four billion today. <laughs> The next night, the high sheriff and the deputy sheriff came and asked us, did we want to go out and make some money? Sid and Ed was their names. And for the next 21 days, they took us out to serenade for the whites every night but Sunday. Sunday, we were at Larry's Corner. <laughs> They'd take up the money for us, pass the hat, make the people not put nothing less than a dollar in it. And then they'd take us back and put us in jail. <laughs> now, mind you, he says, they was busting places for corn whiskey, left and right. And they gave us a whole gallon of that. We had girls coming to the jailhouse and spending the night. We was eating from a hotel down the street. So it really wasn't like being in no jailhouse. But it was terrible because it was against our will. See. This particular part of Mississippi was really starved for music. And the police officers, they liked the way we sounded and just took advantage of being police officers. They knew the only way they was going to be able to enjoy us was to lock us up. <laughs> Sunny Boy was doing quite a few country and western things. You are my sunshine and stuff like that. But we would do the blues for them too. Them white people down there always did like the blues. They just didn't like the people who created the blues. <laughs> Well, by the time our 21 days was up, we had close to $1,000 a piece. So old man Ed asked me and Sonny Boy at the same time, look, if I cut y'all loose, what y'all gonna do? And I mean, I'll tell you the truth, even if it hurt me, I grew up like that. I said, Mr. Ed, I'm getting the hell out of here. Sonny Boy said, whoa, sir, I'm gonna s s stick around for a while. They laughed and let us out. Knew damn well he was lying. And as soon as we got out, we hit the highway. <laughs> Thank you.